volunteer. Great. I volunteer. Where is that one? Did, did Tom tell you how to work it? Nope, but we're recording. Well, let's see. <laughs> you know how to work it, and somebody else. Yeah, I can work it. Just, just press the red button. It's recording. Yeah. All right, we're good. All right. All right, let's work so. Now, oh, let me before I before I go into the physics, let me tell you that's been a development that was reported today in the New York Times, and I think in Nature, certainly in Nature and Science, and in other and, uh, other journals. Uh, a big government project called, I think, ENCODE um, did a, looked at DNA, not simply the genes, but the whole sequence, including the, uh, the junk DNA. Human DNA is about 10 feet long, maybe 3 billion base pairs. Um, and what they found is what some people had suspected for some time, Namely, that the junk DNA isn't junk at all, and in fact, it's it's it plays a mysterious role of regulating the extent to which the actual genes are uh, expressed and used in different cells at different times in different people and so forth. Um, part of this was understood, maybe. 15 years ago when microRNA was discovered, these are maybe 20 face pair long uh, segments of, um, of uh, RNA actually that um, would then be coded in, in DNA by short 23 face pair roughly maybe longer. Anyway, segments and these things um, sort of reduce the amount of protein that a given messenger RNA uh, expresses. What happens in a cell, of course, the DNA is copied into uh, messenger RNA that gets exported out of the nucleus. The messenger RNA then is, is translated into protein. And uh, if it's unregulated, it just translates and translates and translates and translates. But the messenger, the micro RNA gets on the back of the messenger RNA and suppresses the, stops the translation in the protein process at a certain point. So that was a regulatory mechanism which presumably is embedded somewhere in the junk DNA. But um, of course the question then arises, how do you know how much messenger RNA to express in a given cell? And so there's, there's some deep dark mystery having to do with all that junk DNA. It's, it's, a, it's a hierarchy of switches how they work, I have no idea. I don't think anybody understands, um, but it's a, an important new development in biology. And eventually, um, if uh, science continues to be funded, uh, um, which isn't entirely clear, um, then uh, the real advances in medicine is in biology. So that's. Uh, I, I put I, I put on the class webpage a an article from the latest Nature, which is sort of a, um, a description of this from sort of thirty thousand feet, um, and uh, what I I didn't read the Nature article I read the New York Times article, which is a description from a hundred thousand. Any questions? All right, so on to the physics. Um, about the homework, um, do, you, do you guys want to hand it in now, or should we make it next Monday? When I originally assigned the assignment, I thought we were going to have class on Monday, and that on Monday we discuss whether it should be due on Wednesday. Um, shall we, we, is the consensus that we should have it due next Monday, or do you all want to turn it in right now? Monday. Monday. Yeah. Okay, let's say next Monday. <laughs> let's say next Monday and um, uh, so it's basically to do two, exactly two two-dimensional integrals. It shouldn't be beyond your power. Um, okay, now the, the the, the way I think you should study for the course is I think you should um, I think you should get a copy of Z's book 
and uh, read it, and but also read the notes that I put on the web page. And I think I'm going to follow. I'm going to follow my book because I think that if I follow Z, then it's kind of redundant. Um, so I think what I should do is say, you guys read Z. I'll sometimes follow Z very closely, and I'm following him sort of closely. Well, not very closely, but I, I, I think you should ask in class questions about Z as well as questions about what I present. But I think by presenting a different approach, you'll have uh, two ways of understanding the thing. Z, Z um, writes very well, but makes leaps. Um, I think his thesis advisor was Sidney Coleman. And Sidney Coleman was somebody who, when he was a high school student, had magic as a hobby. And so his writing is excellent, but um, I think there's a patch that's a little bit messy, skips it, and so um, uh, so I think it's it's good to have both approaches. So I'm going to do the detail work in class, and at home you can read the Z stuff. Uh, um, so. What we were doing last was um, we basically worked out something that I was calling. Uh, let me let me just show what the final result was that we got. What we got was that the ground state of some theory, a time-ordered product of Q of T1. Tn, we were doing this in just single particle quantum mechanics, which is the simplest context, was an integral q of t1, q of tn, e to the minus s euclidean of q dq divided by integral minus s euclidean of q dq. Notice that because the thing gets expressed as a ratio, all these normalization factors that are um, that can be puzzling, in fact, cancel. But as you saw, as we saw in class, those normalization factors really are normalization factors, and so this this the numerator and the denominator actually separately make sense. <coughs> now. We could, um, let me just remind you what some of these symbols mean. This, this thing, I could have put a, an E here for uh, Euclidean, and what that means is, uh, let me get the right page here. Euclidean of T is E to the TH Q t to the minus th, where this is just the ordinary, we just have q and p is i, or if you want i h bar in unnatural units. Um, now, we could make a, a, a big step forward just by going from just q p equals i h bar to q i p j equals i delta i j or i l h bar delta i j and then we could have had um, let me make these upper indices because I've got so many subscripts so this could be q oh I don't want to call it q1 well now it's getting up a q i1 due to Q I N, and this would be Q I one I N. Actually, that's not a great notation either. So let me make them substitute I one I N. Oops. 
these look like exponents. That's what's not good about that. Okay, so you can go to n particle quantum mechanics just like that. Is that? Are there any questions? Remember, I have chocolate as a reward for every question. And um, people who are just hungry could say, you know, could just say, just pick anything that's obscure and say, please explain that. Yeah. Sorry, you can get one anyway. Oh, okay. <laughs> Anyways, um, so I actually have two questions here. First off, um, I think I already asked this question, but I can't recall the answer. Why is it called Euclidean? Like, oh, it, the, the, that's some of the jargon. The jargon in physics is bad, but it's so much better than the jargon in astronomy. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's called Euclidean because, you know, that's a, you're asking that question is, is doubly good because, you see, we haven't gotten to the point where you see why it's Euclidean. But in a moment, in a, in a, in a moment what we're going to make the transition to field theory. We sort of, I think, did it a week or so ago, but I'm going to do it again. And we'll see that instead of having something like uh, phi dot squared minus grad phi squared, which is what appears in the Lagrangian, we will have um, uh, phi dot squared plus grad phi squared. Or in this context here, instead of having q dot squared minus, say, uh, or in fact, let me put in the numbers, m over 2 minus m over 2 omega squared q squared, we would have something like um, m over 2 q dot squared plus a half m omega squared q squared. So in other words, it, um, we go from a Lagrangian to a Hamiltonian, and when you do that, this part, you see, this is a Lorentz inner product of, of, of a four vector with itself, the four vector being phi dot grad phi. So that's one component, the zeros component, and the, the space component. When you dot that with itself, you get phi dot squared minus grad phi squared. That's in uh, Z's metric. I would prefer grad phi squared minus phi dot squared. And by the way, the notes that are from my book are with the uh, space squared minus time squared metric, z is time squared minus space squared. And as I said, they're equally common in the literature. All right. now my second so question, it's a, it's a, all right, yes. My second question is probably attached to the first question, but in the exponents of e on the- In the L, what? On the exponents of the e in the q thing, should there be i's there? No, 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 there's no i. The progressive? Huh? Right. There's no i if it's Euclidean, and <coughs> and um, when it's uh, the other or Minkowskian, if you want, then it or Lorentzian, it's um, then there is not. That's why there's a Euclidean here. Otherwise, I would have just said Q of t is, and then I'd have i's and the correct signs. All right, those are good questions. Are there any more questions, good or bad? I didn't quite get what your I and All right, right, right. we've got two questions then. Let me, and. Well, I think mine's probably the same question, so. Well, you get a credit anyway. <laughs> <laughs> what? I didn't quite get what you, your Q, I, and what that is, the, the different indices, what you're referring to. The QIN and the QI1. I think. Oh, get, oh! I'm ju I just meant th these. Are, these eyes, of course, this isn't square root of minus one in this case. This is just an index, and um, so this is multi -co multi coordinate quantum mechanics. Instead of just one Q, you have a whole bunch of Qs. So does I refer to the different particles? What? Does I refer to the different particles? Yes. You know, right. For example, if we were talking about one particle, 
then it would be Q1, Q2, Q3 for the coordinates in space. But more generally, it could be, if you were talking about a solid, then you'd have 3n, or a liquid, you'd have 3n coordinates. And, and one, where n could be a large number. And the, the, I, the one that um, follows the i. Oh, it's just the, that this thing space. is at t1. Yeah. And so which q is it? Well, it's, it's the one associated with t1, so it's i1. That's all. It's, I agree it's a overly complicated notation. All right, so let, let, let me do it, let, let me write it slightly differently. I think this might have been clearer. Okay, in other words, we'd say QA at TA through QZ at TZ, and that would be QA, TA, QZ, TZ. And then we'd be, be we'd have, say, 26 coordinates. <laughs> but, um, you know, you could use any alphabet. Or you could use Chinese characters and you'd have thousands. By the way, I, I, when I was in China, I tried to convince the Chinese to give up their system of operation and adopt an alphabet. Nobody agreed with me. But I'm wrong. Um, okay, so let's see. All right, so any more questions? Before we go make this transition to field theory. By the way, I, I let me say I have great respect for China and the Chinese people, so I, it's just how they happen to have invented language and writing before people invented the alphabet. So being first isn't always isn't always a good thing. All right, so um, let's make this transition, as I said before, between, say, QA of T, we can go to something called a field, phi of XA and T, and I'm just going to call this thing phi of X. And, or in fact, maybe I should have written this. Let me write it as phi of T. Um, or if I put the A there, then T A X A. So we go to a field, and um, so we go then from this uh, Q, say Q J P K equals I delta J K with, of course, qj, qk, 0, pj, pk, commutator 0. We go from there to a field theory, and then we have phi of x, let us say, t, commutator. The, 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 the thing that's p, p, let us say, pa of ta, will be called pi of ta at xa, and this will just be called pi of x. And um, when I see I can't get straight which I'm doing here. Let us say tx pi of ty will be then i delta of x minus y, and this is delta q. So that's the, that's the step to field theory. You replace qj with a field at a particular point, and if it's at a particular, notice this is an equal, equal time commutator in quantum mechanics. So it's either, it's, the, it's either the Schrodinger operators, which are time independent, 
or it's the Heisenberg operators at the same time. In either case, it's delta, delta JK. When we make the transition to field theory, you typically are talking about either the opera Heisenberg operators at time zero or at some other time, but it's an equal time commutator at different space points. It's I, I h bar equal to one delta Q of x minus y. And then the phi's will commute with each other at the same time. That's zero, and the same thing is true of phi's. Pi of t x, pi of t y is also zero. Okay, we make this transition, and the Hamiltonian then, which in the case of um, in the case of <coughs> let me do the, the particle case p squared over two m if all the m's are the same and then plus something involving the q's, uh, say qj minus qk uh, squared times, I don't know, let us say m omega squared over 2, but then sum over j and k, this just over j, and then possibly uh, various higher order terms. Well, this goes into, we make the transition to uh, quantum mechanics, we sum over all of these points in space, so it's an integral over space, and it's a half pi squared of x plus a half grad phi squared plus um, a half m squared phi squared, oh I left out the x, um, plus again higher ter order terms and what's conventional and this is a convention that's um, just for the sake of simplicity it's that one normally writes this as p of phi I think it would be interesting to at least in the case of condensed matter physics but possibly in the case of particle physics of considering polynomials in the, in the derivatives. Um, this would break relativity, but um, it could be arranged to break it only on a very high mass scale. And um, so it wouldn't, wouldn't have been seen experimentally. Could we apply condensed matter physics? So you said, okay, why so one? You said this would be interesting for condensed matter physics, but maybe also for particle theory. But okay, so. Oh, if if one if one had one could add terms um, plus a half say grad phi uh, squared squared yeah okay so this would add but this would be uh, you'd have to put an m squared here because uh, the derivative is um, one over a length, and you need to multiply that extra length by a mass to get something that's dimensionless. And if this mass was used, then it, was, it, it, it wouldn't be uh, seen in ordinary physics at the energies that have been explored so far. So why, why condensed matter physics? Why what? Why, why would that be interesting for condensed matter physics? Um, I don't know, I'm just, I'm, I'm just saying, all right, here's a reason why. You, uh, if you look at um, Z's description of um, going from the mattress to field theory, and if you, if you follow what he was doing, if you follow what he's doing exactly, and, but, but put in all the steps, you would be led to put in this, uh, terms like this because instead of just a quadratic thing, you'd expect that the, four, that the potential energy um, would depend upon qj minus, it would be a function of qj minus qk. And if it's a function of, if it's v of qj minus qk, well that's v of 
the derivative of the field times the spacing, the sort of lattice spacing. And now if you expand that into Taylor series, you expect uh, a half a squared grad phi squared plus, plus a half a to the fourth, uh, some b to the fourth, grad phi to the fourth. Okay. So in other words, all right, if, you'd expect in general, in other words, in a, in a, in this, if you're doing mattress physics, uh, then you'd expect v of qj minus qk, not just quadratic. And then you'd expect higher order terms like that and that correspond to this. Now, we, uh, it's considered something of a sacrilege to, to do anything that violates special relativity in particle theory. Um, it's very bad form. But um, if you put in a 1 over m squared, then you have relativity at ordinary energies and not at super energy. Whether that makes any sense, I don't know. And you could also do it <coughs> with the time derivatives and preserve relativity. Yeah. So the 1 over m squared value, though, it would still be nationally small compared to the rest of the equation? Right. In other words, this. This term would be essentially Zippo for all practical purposes. Right. Uh, unless you were looking at very small distances. Mm -hmm. so, that, uh, so how does that not square with special relativity? You know, it would agree with special relativity on at low energies and on large distance scales. Anyway, it might be completely crazy. I'm just saying it might be amusing and it conceivably might be useful in condensed matter, and for all I know, it's, all, it's, it's a whole subfield of condensed matter. I, I just throw it out as something that one might want to play with. Okay, but I'm, I'm not going to talk about this uh, in these notes, in the lectures, at least not now. All right, now what I want to do is I want to take this whole piece and call it V of... Um, phi of x. And so we can write the Hamiltonian then as an integral d cubed x pi squared over 2 plus v. Okay, so this should remind you that the Hamiltonian that we started out with was, it was p squared over 2m plus v of q and now this is pi squared over 2 plus v of phi. So it's essentially, it's the same structure mathematically. And now uh, the question is, well, how do we, um, what, what do we do? Well, just as in quantum mechanics, let's take all these, uh, let, let's go to quantum mechanics, back to quantum mechanics of several variables. Then we have, let us say, uh, QA, and we have an eigenstate of QA. In fact, we can have a simultaneous eigenstate. Since all the Qs commute, we can have a simultaneous eigenstate of all these Qs, and this would be QA prime, Q prime. And the analog of this, and we can also have states, so that say pi B on uh, pi prime is pi prime B pi prime. So these are eigenstates of the, well, I'm sorry, I just, I'm just mixing notation here. Pb on, when I'm not reading the notes, I make mistakes. Yeah, Bernie, I'm in the middle of class. I'll call you back. Okay? He's a very smart guy, actually. Anyway, so uh, P on P prime gives you P prime B, P prime. Okay, these are eigenstates 
the P's also commute with each other so we can have simultaneous eigenstates of them. So when we make the transition to field theory, what we have is that phi, and let us, uh, let's consider, let's think of this, these Q's and P's at, as say Schrodinger operators at a particular time, so these are fields at time zero. So phi of zero x on some state phi prime would be phi prime of x phi prime. And we'll have pi of zero, let us say y, pi prime will be pi prime of y. So these will be eigenstates of uh, these operators with eigenvalue pi prime of y. All right, now this, I saw some frowns there, so I want, um, I, I want, this, this is exactly the same as this, it's just that we go from a we could have an infinite number of Q's. Okay. We can go, we go from an infinite number, but a discrete number of them, to a continuous number in of these in this case. Okay. And in fact, what we could do is um, think of these guys as just rational if we had. We could have a Q here for every rational number. And then we would um, go over here and we would have a phi for each point that was a rational, in which the space coordinates were rational. And then we would have these relations, these eigenvalue relations. But what one normally does is one goes to the real numbers. Okay, are we all, is this clear? Why are we just looking at time zero? Um, uh, why are we going to, because it's it, 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 for simplicity. But it should hold for any time, right? Yes. Yeah, for any time you can have eigen, eigenstates of the field operators and eigenstates of the conjugate momentum operators. Is that a question? Yeah. The, um, in, in the Hamiltonian integral, the kind of field Hamiltonian, you've written them as like pi squared of x. Right. But when you've written... I, I suppressed, I, I didn't say what time it was. Yeah. But, you know, there's this old saw, the Hamiltonian's time independent, so it doesn't matter what the time is. I mean, at least if... You don't have explicit time dependence in the Hamiltonian. But the operators are time dependent or not? The operators what? Well, when you've written phi of zero explicitly down there. It's down here? Yeah, that, that is time dependent. Right, I, ch I chose t to be zero. Yeah. And up here, up here it is simpler to think of them also all at time zero since there isn't any explicit time dependence. But there is a time, there's, the individual operators are time dependent, but the total... Right, but you can, time you, right, but you can, I, you can take them as, uh, at any particular time. That is to say, H is, in other words, H of T, is all this about integrated over d cubed x space at a fixed time, but it doesn't matter what the time is. I mean, you can call that, you can say there's a t over here, and then put a t in to all these expressions, but the way at which, the way in which the Hamiltonian changes with time is by having a commutation of the Hamiltonian with the Hamiltonian, but that's always zero. So the thing doesn't change with time. So now I'm, I'm assuming that we don't have anything in there that is explicitly time dependent. Sometimes one does do that, but I'm not doing it. Okay. 
All right, so to recapitulate these operators, let's think of them all at time zero. Let's think of these eigenfunction relations all at time zero. All right, now, well, let me just mention one thing, though, about this. These states, that are eigenstates of position. Anybody want to guess what the energy of such a state would normally be? Infinite? Infinite? Yes. I suppose the answer to a great question deserves <laughs> chocolate. <laughs> I mean, the great answer to a question deserves chocolate. The reason for that is the uncertainty principle. If you, if you specify the position exactly, the momentum has to be completely undefined. The energy is proportional to p squared. If p squared is undefined, that's an awful lot of kinetic energy. And the same thing with uh, if p is well defined, then, well, then the, 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 the spatial extent is, is, is infinite. Now, does that mean that the thing has infinite energy? Well, not necessarily. But if there's a term in the, in the action, in, in the Hamiltonian that's Q squared, like a harmonic oscillator term, then it would. Because uh, it would mean that Q was uh, undefined, and so Q squared would be infinite. And so that would be true then that massive part, so, so when you go to these field states, these have infinite energy because pi is undefined and pi squared occurs in the Hamiltonian. Similarly, far, uh, if pi, these states have pi well defined, so phi is ill defined. If the mass is non-zero, then there's infinite energy right there. Okay. I just mentioned that. I think it's worthwhile keeping in mind. Now, you remember that Q prime, P prime is e to the i, Q prime, P prime, over square root of Q pi. Oh, oh, um, whoop, sorry. Um, the analog here is uh, phi prime, phi prime is some fudge factor, e to the i integral pi prime of x, uh, pi prime of x, d cubed x, and I don't quite know how to write that fudge factor because it has, it would be infinitely many factors. And it's not even denumerable. Should I take q prime in the next one? q prime, p prime? Yes. I, meant to have it there. Right. Okay, so this is the expression. Now we can say dp prime is just a product of um, d pi prime at each x point, product over all x's. And then we can consider the matrix element phi double prime so that phi is a product, the pi that it is. This is a product. Okay. Oh, wait a minute, I'm sorry, is the, is the integral on the exponent? Well, now I've got two of these to do that. I'm going to be running out of them soon. I'm sorry, it's just a, uh, I wasn't quite sure. Is that integral in the exponent? Yes. All right. Okay. Good question. And what was your question? I was just clarifying that the pi in this case was a product rather than the pi for the field. But right, this is a pi for product. You're right, it's a, it's a it looks better in the notes. <laughs> okay, so e to the minus h phi prime, so this is phi double prime e, um, and I'm taking in the limit epsilon very small. This is e to the minus epsilon over 2 integral pi squared of x d 
cubed x. I'm inserting a complete set of pi states, or pi prime states, e to the minus epsilon integral v of phi of x, v cubed x, phi prime. So that's what we've got. And then, just as we did in the case of ordinary quantum mechanics, this is <clears throat> this state is an eigenstate of pi with eigenvalue pi prime, and so this is phi double prime e to the minus epsilon over two integral pi prime squared of x d cubed x, and that is then phi prime pi prime. And then over here, this is an uh, this is an eigenstate of this operator, and so we get e to the minus epsilon integral v of phi prime of x d cubed x, and then we have phi prime phi prime. But these things, we know what they are apart from some crazy fudge factor, and I shouldn't call them crazy. I mean, it's the correct fudge factor. It's just Hard to write down. Um, in fact, if I were to write it down, I would say it would be a product of the space of uh, 1 over square root 2 pi times this EVI integral <coughs> pi prime pi prime e cubed x. So that's what it sort of looks like. And And so altogether, well, let me go to the let me go to that board then. Over here. Uh, integral in 
phi 0 to phi beta, e to the minus integral 0 to beta, 1 half phi dot squared plus v of phi dqx dqt, and then d phi, where I've absorbed all those normalizing factors into the d phi. So that's, that's what we get. Or in other words, this is um, the integral from phi 0 to phi beta. Phi 0 to phi beta means that the paths that we integrate over are all fields that it, at time 0, or inverse temperature 0, were phi zero and at inverse temperature beta or phi beta, yeah. Are we integrating over three dimensions of time? No, no, one dimension of time. Well, it says D3T. Shit. Okay. <laughs> well, that, was, that was very important. <laughs> so, so I was looking to pattern those in general. So is this, do you have any new paths that are like not continuous or not differentiable? You mean the functions we integrate over? Yeah. Right. I think the deal is that you, you just integrate over everything. <laughs> All even, even non-differential paths. Yeah, or non yeah. Well, let, let me put it this way. Um, I'm not a mathematician, okay? And I, I don't know what, I don't know what state the math, I don't know how the mathematicians treat this subject. Um, So I, I, I don't know what to say, but I so I I mean the, the, the thing is we define it in terms of a limiting <coughs> process and it was clearest in this homework problem, which is the analog of the one I did in class. Namely if we just put three of these things together for say single variable quantum mechanics, then we had to integrate over Q1 and Q2. Okay. But but now these are separated by epsilon, and so effectively we were integrating. Let me use that space over there, maybe. In so other words, we were integrating from a certain point here to a certain point there, but we had to well, from here to there, say. But we had this Q1 and then this Q2, and this is Q3 is fixed and Q0 is fixed. So we're integrating over all functions, and these guys, these functions are are uh, not only continuous, but they're um, they're just straight lines joined together. And so what you can say is that we're integrating over these functions, but as we take the, what we do is we, you know, take these, these things going to zero so that we have, at the next stage, we have three of them. And so we've got that. And then we're taking the limit where we have, in, we do infinitely many integrals, and they're arbitrarily close together, and the jumps between one and the other are arbitrarily high. Okay, so now what that means as to what we're really integrating over, I don't know. But I, it makes perfect sense if you take, you imagine taking the, the limit as we're describing it in the notes and in the lectures. It makes sense to me, but how one should think of this more generally and more mathematically, I don't know. So I can't really remember, but didn't you say at some point uh, that we take the ratio of doing half integrals? That's, that's right. That it, it, so that's how especially, we get in, especially in field theory, you know, where you have the... I think, I think it probably makes sense I, I think those normalizing factors probably make sense, even in field theory. So you don't, but but you wind up taking ratios anyway. And um, I remember I was struck when I was doing the approximating these in these path integrals on uh, on a lattice, doing sort of la a lattice field theory. 
that the way the, the approximation was a Monte Carlo approximation, and effectively we were, I was always dividing by the integral in the denominator. Oh wait, so we're not going to be dividing these, you know, infinitely infinite, you know, recursively infinite integrals by each other to get rid of them? Is that what? Like, well, that what's, what's physically, as far as I know, in field theory, all the actual numbers that you want to compute are ratios of pair integrals. But it's also true that the amplitude for something to happen is simply a path integral rather than a ratio. And I suspect that the um, normalizing factors actually make sense, not only in quantum mechanics, as we've seen, but even in field theory. It's just that they're sort of awkward to write down, like the product over all space points of 1 over square root of 2 pi. That's kind of a weird thing. Yeah, so let's see. Oh, I'm who raised the hand? Uh, I, I just did. <laughs> but uh, I just have a quick question about this. Should there be uh, integrals over dt for all of these exponentials? At this point, yes. But here we only had, here time was just one epsilon step. We only had one tiny epsilon. But are you finding the action? Huh? Are you finding the action? Well, this is just a little bit of action. This is an action over all space, but only it's a sliver in time, or an inverse temperature, literally. Yeah. All right. I thought there was still an integral over time. For the it week. is. It is. It is when you do it here. Now we're going from zero to beta. All right. That's an integral over Euclidean time or over inverse temperature. All right. So this is, of course, um, e to the minus integral 0 to beta of the integral of a half phi dot squared plus rad phi squared plus uh, m squared phi squared plus some e of phi. And this is all dq dx dt. So here's your time integral. But it's it's Euclidean time, and then we integrate over all d pi. Okay, and we can think of this as an energy density, so we would call this an integral over all fields that go from phi zero to phi beta of e to the minus integral h of phi. Let us let me just write that as e to of x. Zero to beta. Okay. Now, making a little bit of we can make a little bit of contact with statistical mechanics and um, by the way, let me just as I'm erasing the bullet mention something. I've been reading an autobiography written by a professor at Harvard named Richard Wilson. He, was a, he started out in nuclear physics, ran into particle physics. And, um, he mentions that in the 40s and earlier in England, serious people, including physicists, um, were spiritualists, which meant that they thought that they could communicate Dead people, you know. And, um, and uh, communicate with particles. Are you saying that they thought they could communicate with particles? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> we, uh, it was that they thought they could communicate with people who had died. And yeah. um, they. Uh, Anyway, so I just thought I'd throw that out as just an indication of how people can have strange beliefs. Um, what do they base that idea on? Huh? What do they base that on? Excuse me? What do they base that on? What? Well, it was more hope than anything. I mean, you know, there was a... 
Christian God-fearing England. And um, so the leap from Christianity to spiritualism isn't great. And from other religions to spiritualism. And it was also wishful thinking. And then the rice gets there were some media who were fakers. And they would um, um, they would um, pretend to be able to communicate with the dead. In fact, it was an, an amusing story. There was one medium who I think was obviously a fake, and she started talking, uh, started mediating between the, her spiritualist audience and dead sailors who had been killed in World War II, and World War II was still going on. And um, she would say a certain sh British ship had been sunk, as, and it hadn't been reported yet in the British press that that ship had been sunk. And so everybody was amazed, and that made her a really credible medium. Because how could she understand? How could she know that the ship had sunk if she hadn't been really communicating with this dead sailor who drowned on that ship? Well, the British War Office heard about this, and they didn't care whether she was a true medium or a fake medium who had simply heard in some bar some sailor who had just come from the from some naval ship and learned about the sinking through perfectly natural means and had gotten drunk and in the bar and told how his friends drowned on a certain ship. In any event, that's obvious that it must be how she learned about it. And but the war office, they wanted her in jail until the war ended <laughs> because they didn't care whether she was a spiritualist or a faker. She, but she was a loose tongue, and uh, she could sink ships, and um, so they um, they prosecuted her. They couldn't prosecute her under the laws that were trying to regulate spiritualism. Instead, they brought out a, a law from I think 1735 having to do with witchcraft, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they could put the law was such that you could put witches in jail for practicing witchcraft, whether or not they were doing so effectively and correctly and actually. It was just that they were doing it, that was enough for them to go in the slammer. <laughs> so they, they locked her up so, so that there wouldn't be any more, so the German spies wouldn't hear about these ships getting sunk and so on and so forth. Anyway. All right, sorry for that long introduction. Uh, all right, let me define Z of beta. This is going to be the trace of e to the minus beta h as a statistical mechanics. And so what does that mean? That means that it would be an integral phi 0 to phi beta. But whereas here we were talking about phi beta phi 0, now we would be integrating See, I need to change this slightly. It's e to the minus beta h. Um, phi d phi. So this is an integral from phi to phi. Does that zero? It's 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 phi zero equal to phi. Phi beta equal to phi. So we integrate over all fields that go from that go from phi at inverse temperature zero to back to phi at inverse temperature beta. That's what that means. Shouldn't shouldn't the phi's that are inside the integral be different than the limits? Wow, what a hack. <laughs> <laughs> What's the question? So should should the I mean since you're you're integrating over five, shouldn't the limits then be a different like just denoted differently at least? Because if you know, phi is an integration variable, then it can't be in the limits or integration field. I mean like should one of them be like a five prime or something? Or yeah. 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 Well, let's put it this way. Over here. 
we're integrating over all fields, that at inverse temperature zero are phi zero of x, spatial x, and that at inverse temperature beta are phi beta mm -hmm. of x. But then what we do is we set phi beta equal to phi zero, and we integrate over phi zero. Okay. And so let me just note to myself there. Okay, so this is then an integral. Yeah, I have it in the notes. I have it into there. That's the way I do it in the notes, actually. Um, this is just a closed path. Yes. Okay, so that's what it what it basically is. And now, remember, we were defining Q Euclidean. We can define phi Euclidean at T, and this is e to the th phi. Well, T x phi zero x. So that's our definition, and. With the same logic that we use when we were dealing with the Q's, well, let me not let me not skip. Let me define the time ordered product then of these phi Euclidean at. I'm not quite sure. Well, all right, I'll follow the notes. If, whether you write it t1x1 or x1 or t1 x1 t1 or t1x1. Really doesn't matter, does it? So, phi Euclidean x2 t2. This is just by definition theta of t2 minus t1 phi Euclidean x2 t2 plus theta t1 minus t2 phi Euclidean uh, x1 t1 phi. Euclidean x2 t2. I, I, I screwed up. Wait a minute. Okay, this, I, I, this is terrible. Um, I really just screwed up completely here. General operators in quantum mechanics are commute, they don't commute. Well, give it to somebody who's hungry. Wait, 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 wait. Come on, give it to She didn't have any. But you can get one by asking a question. And um, once again, I urge you all to ask questions. It, it, it clarifies things for yourself. You also get candy, and um, it clarifies things for other people. And asking a question doesn't mean that one is dumb. In fact, um, C. N. Yang, who uh, was a Chinese physicist who won the Nobel Prize along with uh, T. D. Lee for um, pointing out that parity was not necessarily conserved in the weak interactions. He came down here and um, gave some lectures and sat in on some of our lectures. And what I was struck by was that he would sit in the front row and ask more questions than anybody else in, our, uh, in the seminars that he listened to. And um, that didn't mean that C.N. Yang was stupid. In fact, I'm sure he's the smartest man in the room. Um, but uh, it meant that he wasn't afraid of asking questions. And um, I think that that's good. So I'm urging all of you to ask 
questions. And you shouldn't make fun of people either, because if somebody doesn't know something in a certain period in his or her life, that doesn't mean that the person is dumb. It means that the person forgot whatever it was or hadn't yet been taught it. And uh, you know, so what does that mean? Not very much. OK, so let's, um, with this definition of a Euclidean time-ordered product of fields, we can apply the same logic that we used for quantum mechanics, and we get the following result. That the mean value uh, the mean value of the Euclidean time ordered product, and let me just now use x1. And what do we mean by this mean value? What we mean is the trace uh, of the density operator times this phi of x1, phi Euclidean x2. So I've got two brackets there. And what's rho? Well, rho is e to the minus beta h over z of beta. So this is equal to trace e to the minus beta h time ordered product, let us say phi Euclidean x1, phi Euclidean x2. I'm getting very tired of writing Euclidean. And this is divided by trace e to the minus beta h. Well, by the same logic that we used earlier, this is a ratio of path integrals. This is an integral phi 0 to phi 0, phi x1, phi x2, e to the minus integral 0 to beta, uh, integral dt, integral d cubed x, h of phi, d phi, and then divide by z of, by this, which is z of beta, and that's this thing. So this is the integral phi 0 to phi 0, uh, e to the minus, the same structure here, integral 0 to beta dt, integral d cubed x, script h of x, and then big d. So you see, these, the mean value of a time-ordered product is naturally a ratio of path integrals. Um, and it's certainly true that as we take the limit beta goes to infinity, what we're getting is the mean value of the Hamilton, uh, the mean value of the operators not in and not at a temperature, an inverse temperature beta, but rather at um, rather in the ground state of the theory. So in other words, vacuum, time ordered product, phi Euclidean x1 dot 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 phi Euclidean xn in the ground state is integral phi x1, phi xn. I write my phi's sometimes two different ways. Um, I mean the same thing usually. Uh, let me just write this as e to the minus s e of phi d phi. And now this Euclidean action is the integral d fourth x of this h of phi. In other words, we're integrating, net, we're letting beta go to infinity, so this is an integral over um, from inverse temperature minus infinity to inverse temperature plus infinity. Yeah. Is there a difference between your strictly H Hamiltonian and your straight H Hamiltonian? Between my because in some 
in some spots you have like e to the beta h, and it's a string. Okay, H. yes, good question. This is the operator. Script h is the function of the fields that gives you the Hamiltonian density, the energy density. Good question. Okay, now this is a very important formula. This tells you, and in fact it's extremely general, you can go from this to essentially, yes. Sorry, I have You're really hungry. <laughs> um, oh, sorry, all right. This is possibly a silly question. Um, so I noticed for some integrals you have, um, do you do the fourth x and then some of you have d cubed x? Right. Why is that? Okay, well over here, good question, over, over here, say, we have d cubed x because we're integrating over all space, but we're integrating over inverse temperature from zero to beta. All right. But over here, we let beta go to infinity. So we're integrating here from zero to infinity and on that board. But then I'm, I say, well, we're integrating from zero to infinity but this Hamiltonian really is time independent anyway, so we might as well integrate from minus infinity to plus infinity. So we're integrating over all inverse temperature. Okay? So in other words, d fourth x means dt, it's just an it's just d fourth x just means dt d cubed x. And in this particular case, the range of t is infinite. Because we want beta to be infinite, because we want to project out the vacuum. The gram safe of theory, which may not be the vacuum. And um, in these quantum field theories, when the, I mean, they're basically, except for the field theories that are, I mean, you have two kinds of field theories. There are the ones that are quadratic that we can do exactly. And in fact, you can do the path integrals exactly because they're just Gaussian integrals. And then if you um, solve for what the uh, ground state energy is, you get answers that are very distressing. You get plus infinity for bosons, minus infinity for fermions, and um, that's not terribly sensible. And, um, and it's not just plus infinity and minus infinity, it's plus infinity times the volume of space, and minus infinity times the volume of space. So it's not as though you can say the infinity is because you've got so much space. The energy density itself is infinite, positive or negative. However, um, that means that we don't really understand how to deal with quantum field theory or that quantum field theory isn't the right theory, we need to get out of a better theory. My view is that if you had the better theory, you could, and you had the theory that actually described nature, then uh, if you solve for the ground state energy, it would be the volume of space times some small positive number, and that small positive number would be the energy density of empty space, and that would be the dark energy density, which is of the order of um, milli electron volts. So, um, uh, it's actually milli electron volts for the very cool. Anyway, so dark energy is presumably that, but it, again, it, it, dark energy is a very mysterious subject and people don't really know uh, what it is. Okay, I'm going, uh, I thought I would have time to do this calculation and I may, but I may not. So let me let me let me start it. So what I want to do is I want to change the Hamiltonian by um, adding. Uh, I want to I want to consider the following: S e of uh, v comma j, and that will be integral d four of x. 
h of phi, and I want to get this sine straight here. Function. It's a function of space and time, and it's whatever we want. And it's a it's a tool that we it's a mathematical device. Um, and if you if you read Z, and I, I urge you to read Z, he's a very good writer, and he tries to. In fact, he succeeds in emphasizing the important points, whereas I'm sort of emphasizing the unimportant points. Well, I'm, I'm trying to emphasize everything so that you really understand everything because this, I, I think it's better, but um, but Z gives you these. Um, okay, so let's let me let's let's look at this thing that we're. I'm, let's just look at this for the moment. Integral e to the minus. Script H of V minus J V D fourth X or a D V or equivalently integral E minus integral H D fourth X plus integral J V D fourth X. Okay. E C. So that's what I'm going to try to compute. And now <clears throat> Let's look at this. Let's look at what it is. And you see what we have here is integral e to the minus integral one half phi dot squared plus a half grad phi squared plus a half m squared phi squared, and I'm going to be talking about h0, so I should have said that uh, that h is h0, which means that I'm setting p equal to 0. So there's no polynomial there that would be arbitrarily complicated. And um, it's then, maybe the easiest way to write this is minus 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 plus j phi d4 x d phi. Okay, so that's what I'm talking about. Now, we can write this in a, in a sort of nicer notation. It's e to the minus a half d mu phi squared, where take the time derivative, and then we take each of the space derivatives, so these are four derivatives, and there's no mystery about minus signs when you're in Euclidean space, so it's just, these all come in with plus signs, minus a half m squared, phi squared, and then plus j on d4 x d5. And then, we integrate five parts. So we write this as, and when the integration by parts occurs, we get minus, we get rid of the minus sign in all these cases. And so we have an integral d fourth x, one half phi, and now we have d squared minus m squared phi, and then we have plus j phi, and then d phi. All right, well, when you have a, whenever you have something, a differential operator that only involves derivatives, 
and doesn't involve functions of space, then you're always better off with Fourier transforms. And so I'm going to let p of x be an integral e to the i p x pi tilde of x d fourth p over 2 pi to the fourth. And since we're Euclidean, we can consider this thing to be all plus signs. Okay, that way we don't have any conflict between my notation and, and um, z's notation. All right, we've gone too far. I'll, um, I don't want to keep you guys here over, uh, especially since we haven't solved the heat problem. So um, I'll pick this up next time. So the homework will be due Monday, um, and I'll continue this. What I'm going to show, what, what I'm going to show you eventually here is that scalar fields are attractive. So the theory of the scalar fields is a theory in which um, uh, in which the field uh, attracting uh, gravity is um, is is a tensor field, but gravity is also attractive. But um, vector fields are different, and in vector fields, well, as you know, optic charges attract, and the light charges repel. Yeah. All right. We're